I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Duncan Pentland. Duncan is a lecturer at Queen Margaret University, Edinburgh. After retraining as an occupational therapist, Duncan worked in stroke and orthopaedics before completing his doctorate. He currently teaches across all levels of occupational therapy education with special focus on critical decision making and the development and evaluation of occupational therapy practice. His research and practice development work focuses on people living with neurological conditions, primarily developing methods and capacity to improve and evaluate the outcomes of complex interventions. Duncan is a co-author of the new Royal College of Occupational Therapists publication, Occupational Therapy and Complexity, Defining and Describing Practice, and has conducted trailblazing research in this area. He will reveal a model of theory and practice that underpins occupational therapy philosophy and delivery. I give you Dr. Duncan Pentland. Thank you for the kind introduction, Patricia. And uh, good morning, colleagues, delegates, and friends. It's nice to see so many of you did make it out after last night's gala dinner. There's a few empty seats, so maybe there might be some sore heads somewhere else. Uh, I promise I'll do my very best to make sure that none of you regret saying no to that extra shot of coffee on the way in. Um, I was very kindly invited by the conference organizers to present the outcomes of the work we've been uh, doing to revise Dr. Jennifer Creek's occupational therapy defined as a complex intervention, a document that many of you will know that first attempted to apply new ways of thinking to our professional practice about 15 years ago. I'm very privileged to have been able to lead the production of this new document, Occupational Therapy and Complexity, Defining and Describing Practice, which we created on behalf of the Royal College to review and update Dr. Creek's work. My intention this morning is to try and provide a brief tour of some of its key points, not to explain it in its entirety. You'll need to get a full copy for that. I believe there are some available at some point in the conference. You can come and see me look deeply uncomfortable signing a copy if you like. Um, but I'll try to highlight some important ideas on how we might use them when we think about different aspects of our work and our profession more generally. By the time that I'm finished, I hope that you'll leave feeling that we've been able to put some words to your experiences of the intricate, challenging, rewarding, sometimes frustrating, but ultimately invaluable work you do with people. I also hope that you'll leave feeling buoyant and optimistic about your practice, assured of your role as highly skilled agents for change, but aware of the practical, intellectual, and theoretical challenges inherent in our profession. To help address some of these key points, I'll give a brief background to the work before moving on to present and explore a contemporary picture of occupational therapy in the UK based on our research work, show how this aligns with current and commonly used definitions of complexity in healthcare, explore some key ideas in complexity more widely, and present perspectives that might explain why occupational therapy can be considered as complex, and finally provide some thoughts about how this might influence what we as occupational therapists do in our practice, education, and research. So the story of complexity in the UK really began in 2000 with the initial publication of the Medical Research Council's Framework for the Development and Evaluation of Randomized Controlled Trials for Complex Interventions to Improve Health. Now I've got that sentence out of the way, I'm sure I'll be fine. Um, this paper was developed in response to the desire to bring the rigor of approaches used in comparatively straightforward intervention studies like drug trials to other types of medical and health intervention with less clear-cut mechanisms between cause and effect. An example of this might be a smoking cessation program where a mix of pharmacological treatments like nicotine replacement therapy might need to be twinned with educational strategies and psychological approaches. Being able to bring experimental evaluative approaches to these sorts of intervention would then allow a range of other activities like economic evaluation, benchmarking, care standardization, and evidence-based planning to take place. Shortly after the MRC published that document, Dr. Creek began working with the then College of Occupational Therapists to construct a definition of occupational therapy in the UK for the purposes of research. This led to the highly valued and influential occupational therapy defined as a complex intervention, which specified and modeled the components of our practice processes, introduced terminology, provided a contemporary definition for the profession, and set a baseline for our research activities. 
For years, this document has helped people to think about our practice, from those involved in developing policy right through to students who are beginning to learn the science and craft of their profession. I can certainly remember using it routinely during my own education as an occupational therapist, and I don't think Dr. Kirk's here today, but I was going to do a public mea culpa and apologize for how badly I misquoted and underrepresented her work as a student. So if she hears this, my sincerest apologies. In the 15 years since its publication, the discourse around complexity in healthcare, and more broadly as an emerging paradigm in science, has continued at some pace, and the topic is no less provocative now than it was at the turn of the millennium. In 2006, the MRC developed an updated uh, different guidance framework that was later published formally in the BMJ in 2008. This work responded to experiences since the initial 2000 guidance, including a range of critical perspectives. The update extended coverage to non-experimental methods and to complex interventions outside medical and health services. And among the limitations that were noted in the original framework, a lack of guidance for how to tackle highly complex interventions and non-health sector interventions, and an insufficient attention to the role of context were perhaps of particular relevance for occupational therapy. Helpfully for our work, this document suggested several indicators of complexity that can be used when thinking about therapy. Together, these three main papers were the starting point for the development of occupational therapy and complexity, defining and describing practice. Part of our role was to think about practice while recognizing that since Jennifer Creek's original work in 2003, there have been many changes and developments in wider discourse about complexity, in ideas about occupation and health, and indeed in many other aspects of our world. In 2003, the first iPhone was still four years away, as was Tony Blair's last day in office. The Arab Spring would be another seven years, and the new Cold War initiated by the annexation of Crimea was still more than a decade away. The Royal College asked us to work with Dr. Creek's original and revise it in the light of relevant new knowledge and ideas and perspectives that are available to us today. Our intentions were to stay true to the original, and we hope that the results of our work will allow people to think about what occupational therapy is, as well as stimulating discussion about how it can be studied and developed. Well, my colleagues at Queen Margaret University Edinburgh Sarah Kantarsis and Maria giazzi Clausen and I began the work, there were several things we knew we wanted to achieve. Our main aims were to describe the current practices of occupational therapy, generate a model of contemporary occupational therapy that described and explained the components of practice, and identify in how contemporary occupational therapy might align or not with the concepts of complex interventions. There were also some specific methodological features we wanted to include. The first of these was to take a broad focus and collect data that provided a contemporary perspective of occupational therapy that was based on a range of different information sources. We were aware that relying on any single type of data had the potential to overrepresent certain voices and perspectives. For example, relying only on peer-reviewed journal articles might mean that we collected data that disproportionately featured ideas from practices that lend themselves to study, either by the funding available, the nature of the intervention, or even the publication of special editions. We chose instead to look at all publications which featured reports on practice, regardless of whether these were peer-reviewed research papers or other types of literature, such as magazines. We also sought the perspectives of occupational therapy students, therapists, educators, support staff, and so on. We did that through an online survey and then followed up with more in-depth online focus groups. The headline numbers from these three iterative data collection activities were 256 papers reviewed. If we'd known it was going to be that many, we'd have done a very different search. Uh, of which 123 were from peer-reviewed journals and 133 were magazine articles. We looked at, or we invited 783 people to respond to the survey and followed up with 17 participants in three online focus groups. This generated a significant amount of data for us to work with, spanning descriptions of how, where, and with whom occupational therapists in the UK practice, right through to perspectives on occupation and its role in causing change, and ideas about complexity in practice. Our second challenge was to see whether this data, once analyzed, could be used to create a description of occupational therapy that we could compare with ideas laid out by the MRC guidance. We wanted to do that without eliding the key themes that were drawn from the review, survey, and focus group, and without trying to forcibly align our data with existing theories. We used modeling processes to help with this and trying to ensure that the results remained authentic to the contemporary opinions and perspectives we'd examined, but also allowed interactions between different components to be named and visualized. Our intention was to create 
a way of describing occupational therapy that was first compatible with all of the perspectives and accounts of practice we'd collected. Second, ordered so that we can consider if and how it fit with established ideas about complex interventions. And third, accessible to a range of people by being visual, but also clearly linked to core ideas about occupation and therapy. So to achieve this, we tried to model occupational therapy using findings from the data. As a starting point, we used the different process components for evaluating complex interventions suggested by Graham Moore and his colleagues. In their 2015 paper, they provided a framework based on understanding different aspects of intervention, including identifying underlying causal assumptions, describing the content of an intervention, explaining theorized and known mechanisms of impact, and identifying the types of outcomes that might be expected, as well as being aware of the influence of different contexts on how those things might proceed. For each one of these different headings, we developed occupational therapy-specific definitions and then linked these into a visual representation of practice. Each time we developed a model uh, representing practice, we developed it and tested it against findings collected from our data and from a range of hypothetical scenarios to ensure that it consistently described the range of practices we were aware of. This continued along with refinements and definitions until a stable and consistent representation of practice was developed. So, what's the best way to get some occupational therapists to attack a problem like that? It's quite simple, really. You lock them in a room with the biggest bit of paper you can find, which is about 12 feet long, um, as much art material as a university can offer, and don't let them out again until they won't even look at the camera, never mind say cheese when you want to take a photo. <laughs> if you do that, hopefully you'll get a sensible result. 15 or so iterations of model building later, we had a new description informed by key themes from the MRC frameworks and associated guidance, but consistent with descriptions of occupational therapy and able to withstand our scrutiny. We developed a visual representation. These are some of the iterations of our model developing. Um, we developed a visual representation, representation and an accompanying written explanation that forms what we've called a model, in the sense that taken together, they provide an attempt to represent the extremely broad range of practices and processes that comprise occupational therapy on a smaller and more simplified scale. Occupational therapy and complexity presents these definitions in the order of the themes laid out by Graham Moore and his colleagues, but I'm going to prevent, present them in a slightly different order so that I can focus on some key ideas um, that will help us in thinking about the specific nature of complexity and occupational therapy later on. Our description of occupational therapy starts with its definition as a complex dynamic process undertaken to enhance the health and or well-being of people. It's based on an underlying causal assumption that doing as the medium through which people engage with occupations causes changes to a person in their context. The idea that doing causes change is explored in more detail in the text, but we feel it remains central to the underlying idea of occupational therapy. Context is also a key idea in our definition, being consistently represented throughout all the data we analyzed, and it's one which I'll revisit several times later. We suggest that four distinct contexts can be considered in occupational therapy, and start by noting that context has a very specific meaning, beyond the way which it is sometimes used interchangeably with the idea of environment. Context pertains to a unique combination of environments personal factors and histories that influence an occupational being at any given point in time. We're all sharing the same physical environment at the moment, but it provides a unique context for each of us, given the particular characteristics of each individual, including the previous experience that have helped shape each of us. So in occupational therapy, we can first consider the person in context as a term that highlights how context, person, and occupation arise in mutually constitutive processes. Some components of the person in context can be named, such as physical environments, an individual's physical ability, social phenomena like stigma around disability and so on. But these are understood to be unique to each person because of the ways in which they influence and are influenced by a person's experience and understanding of themselves in the world. The unique person in context is in a constant state of evolution or dynamism throughout a life course, informed by and expressed through the doing of occupations. Another way of thinking about this would be to use our existing conceptual models of occupation, all of which link these core ideas of person, occupation, and context together. 
We've deliberately used the optional plural, persons, to recognize that therapy may directly or indirectly influence more than a single individual. Our second focus is on the therapist in, concept, in context, a concept that represents similar ideas, but with a declared focus on the role as a therapist, some components of person and environment are consequently privileged. For instance, institutional environments, professional competence, these things may appear more central and may recur more frequently. However, we've also recognized that an occupational therapist is also a person in context, and thus components of non-professional life course and context will influence the therapy process. Therapist is also used in plural to indicate that a person may encounter several therapists during an occupational therapy intervention. When a person in context and a therapist in context come together, they create a shared third context, an intervention context. This is an inherently interpersonal and dynamic space, which comprises the interactions between a person and their therapist and influences the shared occupational components that form therapeutic practice. And the final use of the term is with the idea of a macro context, which is made up of many of the components often referred to in our existing models as types of environment, such as socio-cultural environments, which are made up of government and political structures, technologies, global and national events. It's shown here in a lurid green, which is a bit much for a post-conference dinner Wednesday morning, so let's fade that out, make it a bit more palatable, there we go. Um, but the term context is used to indicate that these understandings, although they seem to be macro and seemingly disconnected sometimes from our everyday lives, the influences on the person, therapist, and intervention context are ongoing and foundational. There are no boundaries between these different contexts, and realizing that the way that people live their lives through occupation can affect a macro context, while it in turn affects how lives are lived and how therapy takes place, is a really important idea. Within these different contexts, and specifically within the intervention context, we can focus on what Graham Moore and his colleagues called the implementation or the intervention content. Uh, these are the broad range of multiple practices that comprise the actual doing of occupational therapy. And it's at this point that we can return to Dr. Creek's original work, which methodically identified and categorized the different components of a therapy process and the relationships between them. Our description recognizes that all of these different components can affect what and how occupational therapy happens. Concepts which typically sit outside definitions of intervention, such as assessment or information gathering, affect therapy, and thus should and could be considered as parts of the whole process. The intervention context frames the practices of occupational therapy. Again, we use practices as a plural to deliberately draw attention to the extremely broad range of ways in which ideas, beliefs, and methods are actually applied. Many of the types of practice we identify from our data reflected the existing activities developed by Dr. Creek. Our survey indicated that on average, therapists use 11 different types of practice during therapy. Some therapists said they might use in excess of 20 different identifiable practices when working with a person. In occupational therapy, these are configured with each individual person in context in a way which is considered to cause optimal change. The practices of occupational therapy are associated with understood mechanisms of impact the theoretical and known causal pathways to change. These can include very broad occupational ideas. Doing something meaningful can lead to health and well-being, as well as much more specific mechanisms. Doing movements in specific ways linked to theories of biomechanics can improve function and joint mobility. As these different practices are implemented, changes occur. These can be both expected changes due to the operation of an understood mechanism of impact but can also be unexpected changes, which occur due to the individualities of a person and their context, and are thus much harder to anticipate and determine. There are numerous influencing factors that have an impact on the type of change, whether it's positive or negative, and its size that might arise from therapy. These influencing factors arise from events and features from people in their contexts. The changes that occur lead to new understandings of the person and context. Sometimes these new understandings are considered transitions, informal, and part of an ongoing therapy process. These transitions can initiate responsive reconfigurations to the practices of therapy to accommodate new understandings of the person in context, and the pattern might begin again. Alternatively, these changes can be measured or estimated as outcomes. Depending on a person's context, a transition in one instance can be an outcome in another, and vice versa. This practice change 
and uh, response interaction continues dynamically until the end point of a process is reached. This end point can be determined by a person in context and or a therapist in context range of factors. However, the end point of an occupational therapy process will not be the end of changes that occur from occupational therapy. The person in context continues along a life course that has been altered by their involvement in and experiences of the process. Similarly, the therapist continues along a life course that has been altered by their involvement in and experiences of doing their job. This is one of the reasons why we chose to define occupational therapy as a dynamic process. There are constant dynamic progressions and changes to the activities in therapy that may not conform to a set or determined pattern. And it may be difficult to describe all of occupational therapy as an intervention in the same way that we would struggle to describe all of medicine as an intervention. Similarly, there is an idea in dynamism that occupational therapy can act like a force that may stimulate changes within the different systems that comprise a component or a person in context. Having described and uh, defined occupational therapy using our model, a word of caution. Borrowing from Box and Draper, we note that as idealized and simplified representations, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This model is not intended to explain what always happens or what ought to happen, but was developed to help us think about what may happen and importantly how ideas of complexity can frame some of this thinking. Our next question was to determine whether this understanding of occupational therapy based on data from and about practice aligned with ideas about complexity and in health intervention. Uh, Craig and colleague in their updated framework around complex interventions, published in 2006 and again in 2008, mentioned five indicators of complexity. I'll briefly present each of these indicators along with some illustrative findings from our data and our model that clearly suggest that occupational therapy demonstrates characteristics of complexity. Craig's first indicator is a high number of interacting components, which we see in this expanded model, which I'll return to later on. Uh, it's possibly giving some post-dinner survivors a headache. Um, but essentially, it's characterized by a high number of interacting components or parts. This is characterized by the interweaving of context and therapy and the broad range of practices which are used, often concurrently to cause changes to multiple areas within a person in context, and which themselves may be influenced by multiple aspects of different types of context. The second indicator is a high number and difficulty of behaviors required by those delivering or receiving the intervention. This was seen in reports that change in a person requires determination, motivation, engagement, the ability to make and exercise choice, the ability to take risks, alterations to self-perception, learning, to name just a few examples. Often these different behaviors, some of which are very difficult, occurred concurrently and had influences on each other. For occupational therapists, these difficult behaviors included using diverse knowledge and skills to configure individualized responsive approaches the ability to be compassionate and use humor while also being able to apply science, theory, and evidence in practice. Thirdly, Craig suggested that the number of groups or organizational levels targeted by an intervention can indicate complexity. Again, there was an extremely broad variation in practice with many therapists initially indicating that they only focused on causing change with individuals. Many others reported working with a range of people from a person's context. Many accounts indicated that the outcomes of therapy might occur well beyond the specific person they were tasked to work with. Fourthly, complex interventions are characterized by high numbers and variability of outcomes. From the literature review of 256 papers, we identified 106 different intervention objectives, which were measured in 180, 108 different ways. The survey identified that on average, therapists use three different methods for determining an outcome from a range of 22 different possible strategies. Qualitative data pointed towards experiences of fluid outcomes, which sometimes change several times within a single therapeutic encounter. The top two methods for evaluating outcomes were both informal and based on discussion with service users and their families or carers. And there was lots of accompanying discourse about the inability of current methods to capture the variable um, and transient nature of outcomes from occupational therapy. The final indicator of complexity is the degree of flexibility or tailoring permitted within an intervention. The idea of flexibility and tailoring was consistently identified as a core aspect of occupational therapy, 
selecting from a broad range of practices based on an understanding of each person's needs, aims, and contexts, were seen to be fundamental to ensuring that therapy ultimately contributed to outcomes that were valued by a person. Remaining flexible and tailoring or adjusting practices responsively to continually updated knowledge about a person and the context emerged as a key theme. In short, a high degree of flexibility in tailoring occupational therapy is seen to be essential. Comparing our model to these five indicators suggests that it's reasonable to call occupational therapy complex. But this on its own is insufficient if we, as a profession, want to use these ideas. We need to think about what complexity is, what causes occupational therapy to be complex, and what these ideas might mean for the future of our profession. And it's at this point that we need to consider some wider theories and ideas. And the first thing to note is that complexity has moved from being a noun, which describes something that was complicated with lots of interconnected parts, to being a scientific field in its own right, with different disciplines and branches, many of which have different conceptualizations and definitions of what complexity means. For example, there are the specific disciplines of computational complexity, algorithmic complexity, complex adaptive systems, complex dynamical systems, fractal dimensions. Complexity theories have been used to examine why many phenomena behave or exist in the way they do. Examples include both physical and social phenomena, such as neurophysiology, the behaviors of ant colonies, social networks, economies, weather or climate patterns, plate tectonics, and so on, from the infinitesimally small to the infinitely large. Despite the multiple definitions and applications, however, there are some common ideas. One is that phenomena, patterns, behaviors, characteristics, and so forth, arise from systems made up of lots of different interacting parts. Another is that it's not possible to understand the overall or whole of the phenomena by looking only at its parts. Rather, we must look at the relationships between the parts to understand the whole. One well-used example to illustrate these ideas is a flock of birds in flight. A group of starlings, like the image here, may seem to move in completely unpredictable, though quite beautiful ways. However, looking at a single bird in flight, one part of the whole tells us very little about how the flock behaves. However, Understanding and defining how several birds interact with each other allows us to begin to explain how and why these patterns might emerge, and then we can create reasonable models to confirm these rules or laws. This is systems thinking. Understanding something not by looking at its constituent parts, but by looking at how these function as a whole. This is also a definition for a holistic view. So what does this mean for occupation and occupational therapy? Well, firstly, it might help us to understand some of the ideas in the MRC guidance and associated discourse. Ideas like the number of components within an intervention, their difficulty, the number of people that might be targeted, all lay the foundations for thinking about complexity. Put simply, the higher the number of parts, the higher the number of possible interactions, the more complex something is likely to be. The more complex something is, the harder it is to understand the links between cause and effect, and the harder it is to predict outcomes. Early ideas in the medical literature were associated with incorporating multiple components into an intervention, and thus increasing the number of parts in their interactions. If we come back to the smoking cessation example mentioned briefly earlier, nicotine replacement therapy is shown to be effective, but so is the use of certain antidepressants. There's good evidence base for group psychosocial approaches, and there's some information which suggests that community-level interventions also have a solid evidence base. Some of the early thinking about complex medical interventions would have focused on figuring out which are the most active ingredients within these different approaches, and which is the best or most optimum way to combine them. More recently, ideas have shifted to have a greater focus on context, and to ask questions about whether the optimum selection of ingredients would ever be given, possible given the role of context. For instance, the effect of community interventions might be reduced in areas without a strong sense of community, um, or without the infrastructure to host community events. Similarly, any ideal optimum combination might become less useful over time. What if these ideas about smoking cessation were developed before the onset of vaping as both a cheaper, less harmful, and more socially acceptable occupation? If we briefly come back to our model, we begin to see how these ideas of complexity can help to understand occupational therapy. We routinely use a high number of practices during therapy. These might be intended to cause change in multiple different areas, from body structures right through to how communities interact. 
These might happen in several rounds of activity, each configured differently in a process that builds incrementally towards outcomes. Above all, these are all situated in and deeply affected by a person's context. One of the ways we've tried to show this in the new document is through an expanded model demonstrating how some parts might come together during therapy. It attempts to show links and interactions between different layers of context and practice. The key idea, however, is that there are an extremely high number of component parts originating from many different sources. These have the potential to influence how therapy progresses, and many of these are external to practice, especially the practice that makes up the visible aspects of therapy. Indeed, there were themes in our data that suggested that to be truly occupationally focused requires therapy to be developed and designed individually to match each individual person in context. Our next question is about why this complexity happens in occupational therapy. And I mentioned earlier, and I've repeatedly drawn attention to context as an extremely important idea in our new model. We've used the term context to illustrate how people and therapy are situated, but we could equally have used a phrase like component micro or macro systems, though that doesn't exactly trip off the tongue. But it's typically exactly how we as a profession think about people in context. As occupational therapists, we are all systems thinkers. Systems theories are inherent in uh, are inherent features of our conceptual models and many, if not all, of the associated frames of reference we use. Systems thinking in its simplest form is about how something with multiple interacting components works. Often, we have a tendency to focus on reducing the understanding of systems we're interested in into subsystems. And if we take the example of the human body as a starting point, we can see how many different aspects are thought about as systems. If you don't believe me, look at the contents of a medical textbook and see the sections about the musculoskeletal system, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, endocrine systems, cardiovascular systems, and so on. We can choose to view the human body at several different, several different systems levels, starting perhaps with a full physiological perspective, thinking about how all of the different parts work. Or we can look at physiological subsystems, such as the neuromusculoskeletal system, or at component subsystems for this, such as the nervous system. We could also take an anatomical perspective and look at specific organs as systems, or indeed, at the tissue systems that comprise these. We can keep looking at a smaller and smaller system through biology into biochemistry, down through the nuclear processes that we use to understand genetics, through to pure physics, and right down to understanding the quantum mechanics that govern all we know about matter. This has been the dominant way of thinking in the established approach to science. Explain how the components work to understand how the system works. However, these systems are not separate from each other, and from a practical point of view, it's difficult to understand why somebody values a particular activity by examining how their quarks, if we have quarks, and their bosons interact. And this is where some of the complexity in occupational therapy comes from. The systems that comprise a person in context, which are central to our focus and practice, are made up of extremely high numbers of component subsystems. If we use the human system as a starting point again, we often need to understand aspects of physiology and specific physiological subsystems. At times, a functional understanding of anatomy is vital. But we also work with systems beyond these levels. And as I've mentioned, these are written into almost all of our models for conceptualizing occupation. We work with social systems at interpersonal, familial, local, institutional, organizational, community, and cultural levels. We think about environments as both extant physical situations and as socio-culturally created spaces. But we also think about economic systems and political environments which physically and mentally shape the context of people's lives. Crucially, our core philosophy is that occupation and health or well-being emerge from the interaction of these systems. So changing the way in which they operate can change occupation. I think that was beautifully illustrated by Nick's Casson lecture yesterday these big, broad ideas that doing things at an individual level can seriously impact the way the whole world operates is central to the way we think about things as systems thinkers. So let's come back to those key ideas and complexity. The high number of parts, the high number of interactions, the more likely something is to be complex. The more complex something is, the harder it will be to determine the causes of phenomena or to predict outcomes. Thinking about the levels at which occupational therapists think and work about people, contexts, and occupations, we begin to see the challenge in understanding how occupational therapy progresses and how it can lead to outcomes. The number of potential components interaction grows, and thus the potential for complexity grows with each interacting system. Typical examples of studies in complexity have clear boundaries around the systems being examined. 
Indeed, defining boundaries is an early first step in any systems approach. If we come back to examples given earlier of neural function, ant colony behavior, uh, birds flocking, social networks, and climate, all of these phenomena have been selected and defined as systems to enable their study, and with good practical reason. Unbounded systems become exceptionally difficult to study. However, whenever a boundary is drawn and a decision made not to look beyond it, something is potentially lost. If we think about our flock of birds again, focus on the bird, lose the flock. Conversely, every time an additional context is added, the challenge in understanding the system increases, and the more noise or irrele irrelevant information there is for us to work with. Look at the wider ecosystem, lose the ability to see the flock, never mind the bird. In occupational therapy, with our fundamental philosophical claim to holism and our conceptual understandings of person, context, and occupation, we are challenged by the need to take an extremely broad view of the components and interactions that may come together to allow occupation and health or well-being to emerge. In essence, whenever we seek to understand a person in context and think about how to both use and achieve occupation for health, we deal with the interaction of multiple complex systems. This is an idea which has been termed hierarchic systems complexity, which is one of the many different ways of defining and explaining complexity. Here, the idea is that the greater the number of component systems, rather than just component parts, the more complex the overall system will be. Our underlying ideas about occupation is that it emerges from the interaction of different systems, which we typically categorize broadly as person and environment, both of which we have seen can be made up of multiple systems themselves. A hierarchic systems perspective would indicate that occupation is the emergent characteristic of an extremely complex subsystems, some of which are physical, such as the human body, but also the physical environment, and many of which are immaterial and remain deeply in the realm of philosophy, such as ideas of meaning. Many of our uh, focuses are on combinations of these two, such as culture and society. This is one way of understanding why occupational therapy appears to be complex. Our practical work is based not on trying to find the ideal combination of active ingredients that can be applied in most cases. Rather, it is about finding the best way in which we can change the dynamics of a set of interacting complex systems for each individual. Sometimes this involves using occupations to change the way somebody's body system works. At other times, it's about changing the physical or social context which they occupy. Often, it is multiple combinations of these. The unpredictability and variation we see in practice and outcome originates from the people we work with and the complex interrelated nested systems that make up their lives. To directly quote from one survey respondent, occupational therapy is complex because people are complex. I have a few moments left to talk about what these ideas might mean for us. And the first thing to note is that there is much discourse and development to come. The ideas in occupational therapy and complexity describing and defining practice are incomplete as the fields of complexity and occupation are in continual development. The original document was written with a strong focus on research, so this is perhaps a good place to begin concluding. Arguably, current ideas place occupation as emerging from two very different types of system, functional or physical systems, which characterize our physical world, and social systems, which help us to understand the inter- and intrapersonal worlds of people. The challenge of applying scientific methods to understanding the impact of occupational therapy increases as we get closer to trying to understand the relationships between our actions and the effect they have within these interacting systems and the occupation and well-being that emerges from these. The challenge is substantial. The history of scientific inquiry since the Enlightenment has been based on reducing our focus to understand components rather than broadening it to look at holes. However, the idea in complexity theory which suggests that the more we can look at the whole of something, the more likely we are to be able to see the things that can be changed from most effect aligns well with our core philosophies as a profession dedicated to holism. The challenge we have is to learn to use these emergent methodologies associated with complexity to achieve this, and to do so in a way which allows us to consider all of those aspects of context which influence the processes of change, not just those which lend themselves to easy observation and measurement. A critical mindset where we recognize that any choice to use one particular method over another at present prevents the full picture from being seen is a good place to start. An additional consideration for researchers is to understand that some of the component systems that need to be considered in occupation are not static. And it might help here to briefly draw some contrast between these systems as an illustration. Thinking about the functional physical systems that characterize our understanding of humans, 
Human physiology has remained largely unchanged for 50,000 years. And while no two people have identical musculoskeletal systems, most musculoskeletal systems work in the same way. An accurate understanding of how a body structure or system was, that was developed 100, 200, or even 1,000 years ago, if accurate, would still be accurate today. However, some of the social systems which comprise occupation have changed, are changing, and will continue to change over time and between places and people. Answers we have today for how to work with people's occupational beings will not be the same tomorrow because the questions will have changed. For those interested in the theory of practice, we can use some of these ideas to recognize that a profession, we are caught in between ways of thinking that have been and will continue to be argued over. One of the greatest challenges and opportunities we have as a profession is to recognize that we are ontological and epistemological pluralists. That all sounds nice and fancy, but all I really mean is that understanding occupation for the practical purpose of improving lives requires us on a daily basis to work with information which is constructed using rational empiricism, the traditional approach to science, to explain the functions of our physical systems, while at the same time recognizing the deeply interpretivist and constructed nature of human experience. Our professional focus requires us to apply these different perspectives, holding on to two very different ways of thinking about the world at the same time. Our work does not supply answers to these challenges. We've tried to, supply some, uh, sorry, tried to suggest some perspectives that might help us to be more critically aware of the limits of current approaches to research, inquiry, and theory. As one example, we need to be aware of the scope of the challenge ahead. At present, we as a species may simply not have access to sufficient data or computational power required to apply rational systems approaches to understanding complexity in occupation. We have scientific methods that are good at establishing comparatively simple relationships between cause and effect when various elements can be controlled, but we struggle and have struggled to apply these consistently when we move on to studying people in broader scenarios. The philosopher Michael Strevens noted that when considering complexity, the quantum chemistry of large atoms is difficult enough. That of large molecules is more challenging still. Modeling the complex genetic networks at work in embryological development is fiendishly hard. Predicting many of the significant consequences of interacting human minds, housing bubble collapses, Hollywood mega hits, popular revolutions, is quite beyond us. So finally, what does this mean for our practice? Well, initially, we hope that our work provides another way of thinking about what you do. Like any model, it will have different value to different people, but it may provide some structure as we inquire about and develop our practice. And I'd also like to leave you with this thought. It's the job of every occupational therapist to do exactly what Streven suggests is beyond us at present. On a daily basis, thousands of occupational therapists across the UK try to make decisions with people that will improve their lives by using ideas and often incomplete information from a range of different disciplines spanning from biology through to metaphysics. So later today, as you leave what has been a truly excellent conference at which a wonderful span of work has been showcased, ask yourself this, which do you think is more complex, more challenging and requiring more skill? Designing a, com a component for a spaceship or a smartphone where there are known laws of cause and effect and stable parameters to work within, or walking into a family's front room or up to a patient's bedside, knowing little or nothing about them, their history or what they value, and attempting to design a tailored and responsive set of practices in an ongoing and changing context that will improve their lives and potentially the lives of other people that you may never even meet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Duncan, for sharing your journey of reviewing the literature and writing the new uh, publication of Occupational Therapy and Complexity. You have defined and described the complex nature of our practice and our interventions in order to promote people's health and well-being. It should be no surprise to us that occupational therapy is complex because people are indeed complex, as you say. The systems thinking approach is certainly helping us to see the whole picture uh, within the context of the person and the environment rather than the parts. <clears throat>
I agree, the high degree of flexibility that you refer to is absolutely essential for the future of our profession. So thank you for your work in helping us and others to understand and explain the complexity of our wonderful profession. I'm sure everyone's looking forward to having the time to sit down, read the book from cover to cover and uh, really get to grasp with uh, the content of it all. I'd just like to remind you all that there are a limited number of the Occupational Therapy and Complexity publications available to purchase at the Royal College stand. Pre-ordered copies, as I've said a few times during the last couple of days, can also be collected from the Royal College stand. And as you know, Dr Pentland will be on the stand to sign purchased copies of the publication during the morning break and at lunchtime today. Just a, th a few things to mention before I draw this session to a close. The, um, the closing uh, plenary session is at 3.35, with conference closing at 4.15. The exhibition closes at 2 o'clock, so do please make a point of going around the various stands during the morning break and at lunchtime, just to make sure that you see all the products and services that are available to the profession to help your service users and you. Please remember that the exhibitors have given up their time and have invested in the conference. They've all paid to be here. And as a, as a result of them doing that, we have all been able to have a reduced fee for the conference. So it's important that we, we spend some time talking to them. It's also your, <coughs> your last chance today to pick up your free copy of the Guardian newspaper from their stand in the exhibition hall. So there's plenty going on. And just at this point, can I say, I hope you've all enjoyed, um, and you're all enjoying so far, conference being in Belfast. We've been absolutely delighted to, to host it here. I know that many of you have said to me that this is your first time to visit Belfast. Uh, and uh, I hope many of you return to take the time to see the, the fantastic scenery that we have here and to enjoy our hospitality. So I hope it's the first of many visits. So thank you, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you back at the closing plenary at 3.35. Thank you. Thank you.